Good morning. Uh, hello, here to continue now with our discussion on natural selection. So up to this point, where were we? I do hope that you uh, are watching all these videos in sequence. So um, I hope you were able to watch the mouse video, the pocket mouse video, trying to get the idea of how the evolutionary process of the mutation, that MC1R gene, uh, how it can code for different fur colors, uh, and then those, again, the mutation, that random process, was it good, was it bad? Again, the mutation is, is neutral, but depending on what situation the mouse finds itself in, uh, can be good or bad, depending if it makes uh, the mouse more visible to predators or less visible to predators. So again, neat, uh, neat study and not too far away from here, right? So uh, if you've driven up to uh, Rio Doso, just keep going a little bit north of, of that, north, uh, northwest, and, and you would uh, kind of get to those lava flows that Michael was working on there. A second video, um, I hope you were able to watch the skin color video. This has uh, some neat, uh, I guess you can say sociological factors, so sociological relevance to it, right? We're dealing with a lot of racism and things like that, but uh, skin color is based in the realm of evolution, right? So this same gene that we found in the mice uh, is then um, sort of uh, selected for against different skin colors based on the environment, on the latitude, the north and west latitude, uh, the exposure to UV, and again, uh, we've always thought that skin cancer, right, that dark skin was uh, developed to prevent skin cancer. But I hope you saw through the video, skin cancer is not the body's primary uh, concern, right? So uh, there's some other factors, and I hope you saw the relevance of the folate, the folic acid. It's a hugely important um, molecule for, uh, for, for survival, for reproduction, and, and that is the primary justification for having lighter or darker skin color, right? The, uh, the availability of folate. So please watch the video and, and see what you learn. See if you can see the integration of ecology and evolution, selection, mutation in, in that video. So we're talking about, again, selection. So I have to address then Darwin, right? So Charles Darwin, uh, who gives credit for this, the, the, the term natural selection and the concept of, of natural selection. Again, without knowing anything about the genetic sort of uh, mechanisms, without understanding the DNA molecule, right? So he, he was a pretty bright individual uh, coming up with all these ideas without having all the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, Darwin, again, procrastinated many, many years before he published, and, and Darwin was a smart individual. He kind of understood, right? I'm going to publish this, it's going to get misinterpreted, and again, kind of what Darwin thought was going to happen, happened. So he was portrayed very unsympathetically, right? People uh, you know, said, hey, Darwin, uh, I didn't evolve from a monkey. I'm not a monkey. I was not an earthworm before. Um, and again, a lot of what Darwin presented was just misinterpreted. It, it was not interpreted the way that, uh, that he meant for it to be interpreted. So let's see if you would misinterpret this idea of evolution, right? So these are misconceptions, right? This is not, this is not, 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 not how we recognize evolution uh, today, how, how evolution happens. So this picture shows an ancestral bird an ancestral butterfly, right? And, and the way that this picture is, is working, this bird somehow evolves into two separate lines. Right? And because of selection, because of mutation, because of the ecology, uh, we start to see then changes and changes. And this is sort of modern time up here. So this is the ancestral ancient species. And we see change as we progress through time. And then modern time, we see a yellow bird and we see a red bird. But we don't see that original orange bird. So what happened to the original orange bird? In this misinterpretation, misconception, 
we say this bird became this bird. This bird became this bird became this bird. And that's not how Darwin proposed. This is not how biology uh, understands evolution. That this butterfly became this butterfly, became that one, became that one, became that one. This is not valid. So again, on the right, the sort of the misinterpretation where the one bird becomes the other bird becomes the other bird. This is not how it works. Here on the left, this is a more realistic view of how evolution happens. So we have some ancestral species. Uh, we're not going to necessarily discuss how that species originated, but we have that species back in time. And then that species itself retains its identity till today. So in the year 2020, we still have mosquitoes on planet Earth. We have sharks, we have alligators, we have horseshoe crabs. These species have not evolved much in the last sort of 100 million years, right? They've been um, around for a long time in their sort of very similar present day form. That's the same situation. Now throughout the evolutionary history, there have been major mutations that have happened major what we call punctuated equilibrium events that have happened that really caused a, a quick change and started a new trajectory of evolution. So today we have the ancestral species around, but we also have products of that, uh, uh, that mutated event that, that happened early on. Right? So on the left, this is how we recognize evolution today. On the right, this is not how we've ever recognized the evolution that happens. So this bird didn't come from this bird necessarily. It, this bird didn't change into the red bird. This bird stayed the orange bird, but its genome, its genetic information was affected in such a way that a new uh, genetic path was, a new evolutionary trajectory was developed. So incorrect on the left, correct on the right. Same kind of idea, this punctuated equilibrium model. To kind of explain this in a weird way, uh, this is gonna make sense to some of you video game lovers, right? So um, before a lot of your time, as I know, right? But this was the great grandparent of modern video game systems, 1977. Uh, 1977, the world was introduced to the Atari 2600, right? Um, not real fun, not really exciting, didn't capture kids' attention very much, right? Um, a couple years later, 1982, oh, you know, this starts to, to have an impact. So the Atari 2600 was replaced by the Atari 2600A. And I never understood what the A stood for. For us, it stood for awesome, right? Uh, this is when the world was introduced to Pac-Man and Galaga, Space Invaders. Uh, you had joysticks with one button you didn't have all these buttons like the controllers today you had that one button on the left thumb yeah uh, as we progress again this may or may not be correct here <clears throat> but we had the atari uh, over time nintendo kind of dominated mario and uh, sega was kind of dominant at, at one point uh, we go then to the sony system playstation Xbox, and, and excuse my ignorance on this topic, but um, I don't know what is right now the pinnacle, the top of the line, um, the best video gaming system. Is it the PS4 system? Is it the Xbox One? Is it the, the PC systems? Um, I don't know. Maybe you have an opinion. Maybe you can justify it with fact. But um, if we misinterpret this picture, right, we would say that well, Atari turned into Nintendo. Nintendo turned into PlayStation. PlayStation turned into an Xbox, right? And you know that that's not the case. If I look on eBay somewhere, I'm sure I can find an Atari system. If I dig through some old boxes in storage, I bet I can find my old um, Nintendo uh, system, right? Uh, Nintendo is still Nintendo. It, it didn't change into anything else. That would be kind of cool if it did. I go and dig up the old Nintendo from storage and it's no longer Nintendo. Now it's a, a PS4 or something like that. 
but, but we know that's not how it works. It's not how, how this, uh, this evolutionary uh, process happens. This is much more realistic, right? So uh, Atari sort of gave us the first software, the technology, the graphics, programming, all that stuff. And it still maintains its identity today. Right? It's evolved a little bit, but it's still Atari. Somewhere on, we developed new microchips, microprocessors. Somebody brought in some new creativity. Um, and we had a major uh, branch off here that led to the Nintendo system. Somewhere else over here, we have a, a different idea. Uh, the evolution of now the, the, the CDs, right? The, the discs, right? So that took the gaming system in a very, very different path over here. So again, the whole point of this, the original idea, the original starting system is still intact today, but did give rise to different aspects. And that's the same sort of idea if we back up, same system that's happening here. So the original maintains its identity, but we do have some branches and variations off that original path. So again, hope that makes sense. Um, another thing that confuses students is the idea of evolution affecting the, the whole uh, sort of uh, everybody equally, right? So something that students confuse as well is that evolution and selection are affecting the uh, individuals, right? This is not quite true. Mutation can affect the individuals. Again, so let me say that again. Mutation has an impact on the individual, but selection works at the populational level. So individuals can be mutated. Let's say this uh, wildebeest got mutated to be strong, fast. Well, its role in the entire population then is what selection works on. Right? So selection works on populations, not on the individuals. So Populations are what evolve and become adapted to the environments in which they live. So uh, we're looking at the whole gene pool within that population. Uh, I'm gonna upload a little video on frogs if I could find it. Um, kind of link that into the uh, blackboard. Trying to show you how the, again, the effect of the frog varies from the effect of the entire population. So uh, keep an eye out for that after this lecture. All right, so a couple of things are happening here, right? So Darwin is traveling. Darwin is coming up with this idea about individuals and natural selection at the populational level, um, trying to see that organisms are trying to camouflage into their environment. And then he started seeing species like these. It's birds, particularly birds, uh, loud singing birds, very colorful birds with these big displays and dances. And, um, and he was trying to make sense, wow, why is this bird attracting attention to itself? Why is it trying not to hide and camouflage and be safe? Right? So uh, he did struggle a little bit with these types of creatures, right? Why? Why so brilliant? Why so colorful? Why so noisy? And, and, and then he would see, well, within the same species, we have the male, very brightly, very showy, very loud. And then the female makes much more logical sense in this, in this bird species or these duck species. Uh, the female is concerned about camouflaging, about surviving, about uh, being safe. And the male taking these big chances, trying to draw attention to itself. So it took Darwin a little while to figure out why, 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 why the case? Uh, what Darwin did not know Right. Uh, what we know now today is that this process, trying to be colorful and showy and loud, um, is trying to attract a mate. Right. So it's trying to be visible, be seen. We're trying to attract mates, but at the same time, we're also attracting predators in this situation. So uh, had Darwin known a little bit about DNA, it would have helped him solidify his, his, his ideas a little bit faster, a little bit better. But... Um, we're not going get to in, get into the full discussion of DNA, 
but we know we do know that DNA is the genetic code that programs you. Right? It makes you who you are physically, um, gives you certain qualities, certain talents, certain personality traits. But we know that DNA is a selfish type of molecule. This this idea of DNA being the selfish gene, the Dawkins uh, uh, hypothesis. So DNA wants to take care of you, but DNA wants to ensure that uh, you uh, pass on the DNA to the next generation, right? If, if, if you don't pass on the DNA, uh, that DNA dies with you, right? It, it's not continued to pass on. So within the idea of conflict, right? why, why are these kids fighting? Well, DNA is trying to, to gain resources for, uh, for oneself, right? DNA wants to take care of you, help you survive. Um, if we think back to the COVID outbreak, why was there a toilet paper shortage? Well, DNA is concerned. Hey, self, uh, we might need some toilet paper. I don't care about the other people. They can find something else, but damn it, we need to, to take care of ourselves. Go buy extra toilet paper, right? There's that selfish uh, sort of behavior. And then at puberty, we get this idea that we need to start reproducing. And there's this signal uh, coupled with the hormones, the testosterones, the estrogens, um, uh, coupled with the actual genitalia that, uh, that when engaged in the sexual act is, is pleasurable, right? So it feels good. We're getting hormones that make us want to engage in that activity. And we're having the instruction that tells us, go reproduce, go reproduce. So all collectively um, kind of having a huge impact on the psychology of an individual. Uh, somebody sent me this picture of where Easter eggs come from, right? So eh, can, uh, that bunny's uh, having a fun time there, right? Um, if you've ever been some, at somebody's house and the dog gets very comfortable with your leg, very intimate with your leg, it's kind of awkward, right? But hey, the dog is just following their, their programmed uh, instructions there, right? Uh, this dog, we can see, wow, she looks skinny, but you can tell she's nursing, right? So uh, DNA could have said, no, you don't have enough food for you, don't reproduce. But that's not what DNA said. DNA said, well, he's a little bit handsome, go for it, right? YOLO, right? Go, uh, go have babies. And, and again, DNA got itself passed on to the next generation. So DNA can be quite manipulative in, in, a, in a biological system, right? So it, it it encourages uh, certain activities that enhance the probability that the DNA will be passed from one generation to the next. So I don't know, I, may, I don't know anything about your life, but you may have found yourself in this situation, male and or female. Um, it's a life-changing situation, right? Uh, definitely, you know, changes the, the path of your day. Uh, but does DNA care that, oh, these young couple, this young couple, they're young, uh, they're full of potential. They can do so much. Does DNA care that it's not the best time uh, to start a family? Or, um, you know, does DNA think about the, the parents are going to have enough resources to provide to the kids? No, DNA doesn't care about that. DNA just cares that it's my chance to reproduce myself and it's going to manipulate the organism to do so. So again, mo I promise you, you can write this down, right? Most of your bad decisions in life can be linked back to the selfish drive of DNA, trying to get itself reproduced, right? So uh, DNA, very manipulative, uh, definitely has this ulterior motives within our, our cells, for sure. So uh, this peacock is following his genetically programmed instruction. I got to make a lot of noise, be very visible, and I'm going to be very colorful in a, in a, in a, in a forest you know, brown world, brown and green world. So I'm going to be all showy and dancing and making loud sounds to try to attract a mate. Again, but at the expense of attracting bad attention, attack, attracting the attention of predators that could cause harm to this organism. Uh, I'll post a complimentary video that shows some of these mating displays to kind of give you some more insight on that. But... Um, what Darwin was trying to, to kind of make sense of with these peacocks and all this, and um, I think maybe you can relate. Some of you have put your life at risk, your health at risk,
trying to impress somebody else. Uh, let's say you have a little bit of money. Oh, I'm so hungry. I could spend this money to help myself and buy a sandwich. Or I can go uh, pay this uh, money and buy this person a drink. Maybe, oh, maybe they'll uh, want to engage in certain activities with me. So again, this all falls under the realm of sexual selection. So sexual selection is Darwin's explanation for the evolution of useless but conspicuous traits in males of many species. So useless, he defines useless as not helping the organism to survive. It's not helping the organism's life extend. Right? It's not giving the organism food. It's not helping the organism outrun predators. It is useless for survival of the individual, but it may help the males uh, attract mates to keep its DNA um, sort of progressing there. So these useless but conspicuous traits like bright colors, long tails, antlers, uh, these dances, courtship displays, uh, and again, normally found in males in wild, in wild species. Um, and why do they have them? To make the males more attractive to females. So. Again, that's telling us that the female is the one that's doing the selecting. So the males are doing all this stuff. It's the female that has that selective power. And, and at this age, at college age, males, females, I think you figured this out, right? Ladies, it's you that have the selective power. Uh, I don't care how evolved we are, but um, uh, let's say we're going to go to prom. I don't know if you all went through this, uh, this nervous time, right? Uh, typically, the males are the ones that go and, uh, yes, uh, hello, uh, uh, I was wondering if you'd like to go to prom with me, right? And so the males are doing the asking, but ultimately, it's the female that does the selecting. Yes, I want to go with you. No, I don't want to go with that one. No, I don't want to go with that one. So uh, if you go to a bar, right, um, who's normally buying drinks, right? It's the males buying drinks, um, and, and, and it's the female then that ultimately, okay, yeah, I'll take a drink from you and yeah, maybe I'll pick that person to spend the evening with or this person to spend the evening with. So it's the female in nature that, that typically has the selective power and, and that has a big impact on sociology, a uh, big impact then on these conspicuous traits that have evolved to enhance the male's chance of being selected. Yeah. Now, uh, I know in the year 2020, and, and, and we're now in the um, you know, modern times where you have different sort of uh, same-sex relationships, but within the same-sex relationship, you still have an individual that um, is more of the selective role and one of the one that's sort of trying to be selected. So, so you can analyze any relationship and you'll see that same dynamic uh, in play. And again, it's maybe sad, maybe it is what it is, but... For males, it's a numbers game, right? And males typically handle rejection better than females because males get rejected all the time. So males have to, uh, you know, buy drinks for so many people. Males have to ask so many people out to prom before one of them finally says yes. So um, again, different psychology that's developed because of this, uh, this sort of evolutionary background that we bring in today. Uh, here's an example of a, of a little fiddler crab. Right? The little fiddler crab, the first thing you notice is this big giant claw. And then a regular normal sized claw. So weird, right? If we were like a fiddler crab, we would look something like that. Look at that huge oversized arm and then the regular normal arm, right? So that's how fiddler crabs basically look, right? And, and there's a reason for that because for fiddler crabs, size matters, right? The females are attracted to the large claw, right? The large claw, the males walk around with that big claw in the air and the females like, oh my God, look at the big size of that claw on that, on that crab, right? Uh, the big claw also allows them to engage in battle with other males. And again, it's a way of attracting females. So if you were to, to cause harm or damage to that claw and all that's left is a little tiny claw, Eh, females are not going to be interested in, in that male. So this is an idea of how um, natural selection would work based on uh, sort of conspicuous traits there. So again, this is a subdivision then of natural selection is natural selection. 
And then under natural selection, we have this idea of sexual selection. Uh, antlers work the same way. So here we have a, a deer with these large antlers. This is the male. The female doesn't waste time, waste calcium, waste energy developing antlers. Uh, that's telling us, well, maybe they might be used in protection, but apparently not. So they are uh, not going to really help the organism to survive long term. The female decides, man, I can use all that calcium to help develop bones for, the, for a baby, right? I can use all that energy to, to develop an offspring. So it's a much more logical type of use than the males. The males spend all this time to develop antlers. They use those antlers to fight the males combat. Um, and then after the combat is over, the antlers fall off. So it seems like a big waste to, to spend all this energy. And again, why are the males fighting? Because who is the selective sex again? Not the males, right? The, the, there's the females then that have that selective choice, that selective power. So we see that over and over and over again with many species of birds, of mammals, of reptiles, of fish, all this kind of, very common throughout the animal kingdom. Whittle bird, surprise, surprise, this is a male. Right? The male, bright colors, long showy tail. Uh, dancing, they hop up, they flutter, they do this really interesting display. And the females are just kind of in the distance, kind of watching. Wow, he's doing a nice dance. Oh, this is, he looks, wow, look at that tail, that kind of stuff, right? Interesting study that was done. Uh, bring it into science, right? Let's, let's generate some data. So we broke this into three groups. I didn't break it. The people that did this experiment broke it into three groups. We have the normal control group, which was the bird with the normal length tail. They established another uh, variable group where the tails were cut. Just the bird was not harmed. They just got a tail cut, right? They cut the feathers. And then they kind of weaved in those feathers into the third group here, right? So we have a group of artificially lengthened, artificially normal, or I should say artificially shortened, and the normal uh, group. So our control, short, and long tail. The birds were released out into the field. Uh, the experimenters uh, had their, their binoculars and they were then kind of uh, analyzing the behaviors. At the end of the summer, the control group was able to, you know, to establish one nest, which is normal, right? It's a lot of work to have a nest in summer. So they were able to father uh, offspring in one nest. Oh, look at the one with the artificially shortened tail. It was, on average, they struggled to find mates, they struggled to start uh, nests, and less than half a nest, you know, the average for that artificially shortened tail. The bird that had the artificially lengthened tail almost doubled, almost went to uh, two nests per that summer. So, wow. So, that's telling us that, yes, length matters as far as female widow birds are concerned. The longer the tail, um, basically they found that more attractive. So in conclusion, the sexual selection in widow birds favors, selects for long tails, right? So they're kind of superficial maybe, but hey, that's a way of, of selecting a possible mate if you're a widow bird. So in the evolutionary process, we can say, well, what would be a good mutation that could happen? What would be a good selection that could happen? Something that would enhance the growth of the tail feathers, right? That would really en enhance the ability to start young. The males with the longer tail feathers are gonna reproduce more, passing those long tail feather genes possibly to their offspring there, right? That's the idea of evolution and ecology. So why was this selection in place, right? The idea is that females prefer males with longer tails uh, because it indicates the male is healthy. If he's, linked, if he's lived long enough to grow a long tail, he's healthy. Uh, maybe that male knows where to find food. Um, he's lived long enough. He's out, out 
blasted predators. He's smarter. He's sneakier, whatever, where he hasn't uh, uh, been attacked by a predator yet. So those would all be great qualities that you would want in your offspring, right? So the females are selecting for a potential father that will give their offspring the best chance for survival. That's this idea of sexual selection within the, the broader context of natural selection. Uh, finches, right? Finches, the males, depending on their health, develop bright, bright red beaks if they're healthy or if they're very sickly, they have very pale beaks. So the females are attracted to the males with the bright red beaks. Red color is derived from the diet. Um, the brighter the, the, the red, the more better food they're eating, the better health they're going to be, the less parasites they're going to have. So it's a way of females uh, seeing which is the healthiest male. We kind of flip things around. Um, and I'm not sure why, why we do this, right? Because again, ladies, you are the selective sex. But yet, ladies, you spend a lot of money. Uh, this is a billion dollar industry, multi billion dollar industry on the cosmetic industry, right? So, ladies spend a lot of money trying to look like finches, right? So, uh, males know. I'm pretty sure, or people know, males, females know that, wow, those are not her natural lip color, right? That's not her natural red lip color. But it's still, maybe we have some phylogenetic, some primitive link back to finches where it still attracts attention. And it's still, wow, look at those bright red lips, right? Let me, uh, wow, let me go check that out a little bit closer. So this is the idea of uh, trying to attract uh, the, 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 a partner for reproduction, basically. Now, for humans, uh, a lot of humans attract mates for the sexual act, but not necessarily wanting to produce a child at that moment. For, for wild animals, it's different. So they're, uh, they're going to attract the mate for the purpose of producing offspring. So I have some pictures here for you. right? And let's start off with this bottom picture. Uh, let's see what uh, selective uh, ideas go on in your mind, right? And some of these are subconscious. You may not even know what you're attracted to or why you're attracted to what you're attracted to. So uh, this is a toothpaste commercial, right? A toothpaste ad. But we have a lot of individuals, a lot of different phenotypes, different skin colors, different eye colors, different hair colors. Um, they all look happy, right? slightly different age in this guy. But let's say that uh, you were going to select one individual there. One of those to, uh, I don't know, to, to have a nice uh, dinner, right? And it doesn't have to go beyond that. Just, you know what, I'd like to, you know, get to know this person a little bit more. Right? Who would you select? And why would you select that person? Right, just this bottom, right? This is this bottom group. Uh, so typically, uh, if it's something that has the potential to lead to a romantic type of situation, uh, the first selective idea would be uh, the orientation, right? Uh, are you attracted to the males? Are you attracted to the females, right? So that would be the step one. Now, once that's done, well, what other feature are you looking? Are you looking at skin color? Is that a very important selective trait? Uh, what about hair color? Ooh, eye co maybe it's the eye color. Maybe it's something else, right? The smile. Well, they're all smiling, so they all look happy. Maybe it's the age. Ooh, I like the old dudes. Or no, I like the young ones. No, so um, uh, your mind kind of goes through these processes, and you do have that sort of that wish list that, that, that you look for. Now, that can get compromised, right? You go into the club early in the evening with, I'm going to look for this person. Things don't go well for you that evening and your standards kind of fall as the evening progresses, right? And at the end of the evening, you might be with somebody that, oh, I don't know. But, but that's DNA, right? DNA got you in that situation. So let's progress now back up here. So let's add now these people to the mix. Now they're also available uh, that you may possibly want to get to know a little bit more. Right? Uh, did your original person change did you well no i'm going to dump that person and try to get to know somebody up here right so is it something that uh the top 
set of pictures attracted you? Maybe the physique. Oh, maybe she likes fitness. Oh, she looks nice maybe over here. I don't know, right? So, um, and again, some of these we know are not real, but it triggers the attention, right? It captures the attention. So again, the selective aspect. So it's different for each individual, uh, but what is it about the potential mate, the potential person that attracts you, right? What is that, uh, that feature that, that really catches your eye? So uh, we're not widow birds. We can be attracted to long tail feathers, but we're attracted to something else maybe, right? And that goes under the idea of Darwin's sexual selective concept. So uh, I hope you're seeing now that evolution has changed, right? What's being selected for has changed. In the past, it was all about being big and strong. That was necessary for survival. We needed a big, strong individual uh, to, to help uh, pass those genes on to the next generation. For humans, at least, uh, there's been a big evolution now in the mental capacity. So... Um, now, yeah, big and strong is good, and that's still very a very powerful attractant. Uh, but now, some of the most successful people on planet Earth are not the biggest and the strongest. Think of Bill Gates. Bill Gates is not big and strong, right? Uh, but Bill Gates, because of his knowledge, development of computer systems, has had a huge impact on planet Earth. So we're starting to see a shift in the evolutionary process towards intellectual capacity, aptitude. And again, um, that has caused now a certain trend in behavior, a certain trend in selection. Um, but again, keep in mind, this is still sort of programmed in our mind. So uh, the physicality, uh, good health is still programmed deep-seated in, in our evolutionary past. Uh, this is kind of a new trend. But we are seeing, again, that, that shift in the evolutionary process. So with that... I'm going to stop this video here, then I'm going to address another variation of selection, right? but we'll stop this one for now here. So keep an eye out for the second one and it'll appear shortly.